Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mrs. Gonzalez, and do I have everyone? And I'm joined by Finance Committee Chair Abigail Hurlbut, Dan Mills, Paul Bailey. Give me a second to go through this. Ted Hegarty, Dan Palver, Don Kelleher. Do I have everyone, Mrs. Hurlbut? One more I'm missing. These are new glasses. Who else am I missing, Abby? No one, okay. All right, and we are being recorded um, by NORCAM and by the town administrator, Mr. Gilberto. And just for the ease of today's meeting, which is virtual, I would ask all of our um, board members in attendance and committee members in attendance to just hold your questioning for each presenter to the end and so that we can get through this. Sometimes people talk over one another or talk over the presenter. So just for the ease of today's meeting, and I will, I will poll each and every one of you in case you have questions. If you don't, that's okay. You can wave, you know, wave me off. But um, if, if that's all right, let's um, begin with the first presentation, which is Chief Murphy. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's not. <laughs> no, that, that, that's correct. I just wanted to make a very brief comment. Oh, sure. So first, for, uh, for the, those who are following along via this Zoom meeting or who are watching on NORCAM at home, if you go to the town's website, on the town's homepage is a link to the, um, the main document, the fiscal year 22, 2022 municipal department budget requests. So this is something that uh, we haven't done in the past, but have done where we're doing these hearings virtually. So you're able to actually look at the main document itself. For those who have not participated, um, we generally run these hearings based on a PowerPoint presentation, which is Chief Murphy's intention, along with Chief Stats and the Acting DPW Director, Chris Stemming, a little bit later on to do. So I believe Chief Murphy is going to be sharing his screen. Um, I, I'm going to stress for this budget, but also for the, the, the upcoming budgets today, as well as the remainder of the smaller budgets on the Monday evening hearings, we've asked the departments to really scale back their requests for fiscal year 2022 due to the economic and fiscal uncertainty, not just for fiscal year 2022, but also for fiscal year 2023. So where in um, years prior, we would be having these hearings talking about new programs um, that really has been curtailed, although there are a particular, a couple of specific areas which will be highlighted where there are requests. It's, it's very much scaled back from where it has been in previous years. That fact, along with the fact that we are conducting and required to conduct these meetings virtually via Zoom technology um, has caused me to ask the department heads to scale back their presentations. So where we might normally have a much longer presentation you're going to see that the, the, the departments have abbreviated their presentations both today and for the Monday evening hearings. As the chair indicated, we um, certainly will have an opportunity, though, for um, question and answer um, as we customarily have had. Madam Chair, thank you for the ability to uh, offer that comment. I hope it's helpful for everybody who's participating here. And through you, I will turn it over to Chief Murphy. Sure. Welcome, Chief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I just wanted to introduce the members of our department who are here this morning with me. Um, we have Drug Free Communities Grant Coordinator Amy Lockowitz, our Mental Health Substance Abuse Clinician Laura Miranda, Patrol Lieutenant Mark Zimmerman, Lieutenant Detective and Executive Officer Tom Romeo, and Administrator Lieutenant Joseph Thibodeau. Um, just to start off, each year during our budget process, our goals and objectives are set with a focus on how the North Reading Police Department can cohesively contribute to the overall direction, priorities, and vision set by the town. As part of this year's budget process, I submitted a 143-page document detailing the cost of each requested line item, as well as its purpose. I believe that the budget document is one of the most important statements that I can make as a police chief. It translates our department's mission and values into goals and objectives. 
A budget is a foundation that provides us focus um, to effectively allocate our resources on the most important issues that face our community. As the town administrator had said earlier, today's presentation is a modified version of what I've previously submitted, offering a brief overview of some of the highlights of our FY22 budget proposal. At the end of the presentation, members of the police department that are here with me this morning will be available to answer any questions related to any of the budget documents previously submitted. So during the presentation, we'll give a broad overview of our performance and workload indicators, our grant funding sources, our budget statement, an update on our fleet, as well as our goals and objectives for FY22. In 2020, we had a 7.5% decrease in calls for service. Um, I believe a good portion of that decrease can be attributed to the pandemic. We saw far less traffic on the roadways, uh, less visitors to our retail and food establishments, and arrests and pro prosecutions um, were decreased. This slide shows a summary of our outside grant funding. As most of you are aware, the police department operates the town's uh, primary 911 answering point. All police related matters are dispatched by our own officers. All medical and fire related calls are transferred to the fire department who operate the town's secondary 911 answering point. This grant covers the cost to train both police and fire personnel in 911 call handling procedures, as well as the cost to equip the dispatch center. A drug-free communities grant is a federal grant program that provides funding to community-based coalitions that organize to prevent youth substance abuse. Our current drug-free communities grant is scheduled to conclude on September 29th of this year, having completed five years of federal funding. We are in the process of applying for an additional five years of the grant. It was originally scheduled to be released mid-February. Our application is ready to go once the grant is released and um, I'm somewhat hopeful and optimistic that we'll exceed the grant criteria and be granted the, um, the would be awarded the grant for another five years, but um, we won't know that until sometime in the fall. Um, if we are approved, the grant will continue uninterrupted. Um, if not, like I said, we won't be approved. Um, we, if we're, we are approved, we won't know until the fall. Um, but I just want to make everyone aware during this budget process in case our application is denied had several conversations with the town administrator and the finance director on how to proceed if the grant is denied. If, is, if the grant is not approved, they plan to bring this forward for discussion sometime in the fall. This program, along with its directive, made a positive impact in our community and will definitely be a priority of our department moving forward. Our proposed FY22 budget reflects an increase of $159,250 or approximately 3.9% um, of the uh, increase from the appropriated FY21 budget. This slide shows the most significant increases and decreases compared to our appropriated FY21 budget. The first category of police personnel costs increase due to contractual increases. The second category reflects the increase in our small capital requests for two mark units, which Lieutenant Romeo will explain uh, during his fleet report. The third category is a decrease in overtime from FY21 to FY22. I just want to make the select board and the finance committee aware that this, the overtime funding request for FY22 is still below the appropriated funding from FY13, which was 702,148. Over the last 10 years, um, I believe the close working relationship between the town's leadership, elected officials, police administrations, and um, the members of the police department have had a direct impact on those cost savings. And even though there's been contractual increases over the past 10 years, I believe better fiscal management and contractual reforms have resulted in decreased overtime costs. This is a summary of our FY21 compared to FY22 um, expenditures, small cap and not total budget. More detailed line by line comparison is in the budget packet that I had submitted. As you can see, we're proposing a 1.4% increase in payroll, a slight decrease in expenditures and a large increase in small capital um, resulting in a 3.9% increase overall. 
As I mentioned, you know, the small capital is a 100% increase. Tanner Romeo is going to now speak to the fleet management update. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, panel members. Um, as you can see in your packet, um, the breakdown of what we're looking to replace this year. As you are aware, we did not um, get any cruises last year in our budget. So it's been two years without a, a, an upgrade in our fleet. To have a proactive approach to fleet management, you need a, a, an ongoing replacement program. And there's a trickle down effect in, in this community as well, because traditionally our recycled old police cars are then given to town hall and used for administrative use for town hall. They still have three of those cars in service now, um, or two, I think. In any event, they've been in service for three or four years, so they do have a life after emergency use. So our plan is to replace two this year. Once again, we didn't get any last year. Uh, the fleet is in relatively good shape. The two units that I'm asking to replace are near their end of their useful life cycle, uh, both out of warranty, one in service um, for over four years. Um, and the miles and hours on both cars are well in excess of what we uh, like to see in our fleet. Uh, Chief, next slide, please. This is a, a breakdown uh, presented by one of the manufacturers, which is Ford, which I would be recommending of what we purchase. This is the hybrid versus the gas. Uh, you can see just in road miles per year, the average savings is 343 gallons per year in normal operations. Chief, second slide, please. This is a breakdown of idle hours. Idle hours is one of the main contributors that, um, that for lack of a better term, uh, kill a police car. Uh, idle hours are, are significant. And, and with the hybrid version, you can save 933 gallons of, of fuel per year and also save engine life. Chief, next slide, please. Uh, this is a summary of, of on average what a hybrid versus a gas would do. Uh, basically, you'd save 1,276 gallons per year uh, when you combine the two figures. And if it's $2.50 a gallon, you're saving $3,500 per vehicle uh, in fuel savings per year. Chief, I don't know if we can go back to the first slide. Um, keep going back, right there. So this is the cost of uh, the gas version of the plant and the uh, to add an additional approximately $6,100, you would have the option to add these vehicles as hybrids. Um, as you know, in previous uh, presentations, I wanted to hold off on the hybrids till they were put in service by the departments. I can tell you, I had conversations with the state police who currently have 160 in service with no issues and just ordered 130 more. They're going to be running 300 units uh, by the end of this year. So I do think it's a very viable option. And you can see the price difference uh, on that slide there. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Um, we have several goals and objectives that we'd like to pursue over the next year. The Rescue Fat Task Force training was part of our FY21 goals that could not be completed due to COVID restrictions. Our plan is to revisit this goal for FY22. Through past lessons learned from real world events, the integrated response of police and fire has evolved. Best practice response involves rapid intervention to neutralize any threats, provide life-saving first aid techniques, and rapid evacuation of victims. To accomplish this mission, police and fire departments have to be able to quickly interface and integrate with each other. In order for this integrated response to work, our departments need to train together. Our goal will be joint training for police and fire, continued training on rapid neutralization of threat and integrated command concepts, as well as large scale training events with North Reading Public Safety Departments together with surrounding area departments. The second goal is establishing an honor guard which was another FY21 goal that we could not complete due to COVID. The public image of our department is an important aspect of its successful operation. Our goal is to create an honor guard unit that will present to the public a professionally trained group of officers that will demonstrate and honor the department's commitment to our community, country, and law enforcement profession. The honor guard will represent our department at community and law enforcement ceremonies. 
Moving on to the Lieutenant and Sergeant promotional process. Over the course of FY22, we anticipate one retirement among the rank of Sergeant and one retirement among the rank of Lieutenant. The promotional process will establish an eligibility list for both Sergeants and Lieutenants. Having an established list is a critical step in our succession plan, as well as our long-term planning. It's an opportunity for us to identify, prepare, and develop staff to ascend to those positions. Also during FY22, the police department in conjunction with police exam solutions will conduct our third open competitive exam for entry level position of police officer. And at that point we'll recruit and market the exam with the goal of creating an extensive candidate pool. We have two specialized trainings that we plan to pursue during FY22. Both of those trainings were presented to me by our mental health clinician, Laura Miranda. QPI training is an emergency mental health intervention technique for suicidal persons, an abbreviation for question, persuade, and refer. The intent is to identify and interrupt the crisis and refer a person to the proper care. Officers trained in QPR, QPR learn how to recognize the warning signs of suicide crisis and how to question, persuade, and refer someone to help. The goal of bringing this to North Reading is to educate our first responders on mental health interventions so that they can utilize that in the field and support someone through a potential mental health crisis. The goal of the Blue Courage training is to provide our first responders with self-care tools and strategies to help support their own well-being while they continue to work to maintain the safety of our community. And in an effort to minimize the social and overall impacts of illicit drug use, our de department developed a multi-pronged approach several years ago. We focus on five areas, including education, prevention, intervention, referral to treatment, and as a last resort prosecution. Um, going forward in FY22 and beyond, we'll continue to build our partnerships, educate our community, and create opportunities for our officers to make a positive impact in this area. I'll turn it over to Amy Luckwitz, who will speak to the Drug-Free Communities Grant Objectives. Amy? Thank you, Chief. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so as Chief Hi, Murphy mentioned, we currently are in our fifth and final year of federal funding through the Drug-Free Communities Grant. So I'd like to take just one minute to reflect on some of the coalition's achievements. Here you see some highlights of our incredible four and a half year journey. I think it's really important to note that we're talking about health, the health and quality of life for our youth, which can be a very difficult thing to measure. But I do wanna give you some real numbers in terms of impacting youth substance use. Each year across grades six through 12, we've seen the following average declines. 2.2% annual decline in alcohol use, 1.27% decline in tobacco use, 1.4% decline in prescription drug use, and a 4.8% drop in vape use. And if you look at that across four years, that's actually quite an achievement. Now, unfortunately with legalization of marijuana, we've seen a jump in marijuana use across all grades um, go up about 0.6%. Uh, However, I can report that compared to other communities and states with legalization of marijuana, this is an addressable number and something we'll continue to work on. Of course, none of these achievements would have been possible without members of the coalition and community volunteers. Right now we have 38 members on our coalition, which is up significantly from back when we started with just 12. I also wanna thank the town departments and department heads. Although I am housed most uh, completely at NRPD and rely heavily on NRPD partnerships, I think virtually every town department has assisted in some way with the implementation or planning of a grant activity. And it's a true measure of collaboration towards a common goal of protecting our youth. Chief, can you forward please? Thank you. Looking ahead, as you know, we'll be applying for one more round of five-year federal funding. Applying for the next DFC grant is my priority, along with reducing substance use. We'll also focus on developing the youth action team led by Jen Ford to strengthen the ability of our youth leaders to inform their peers, as we know that peer-to-peer -peer messaging is the most effective communication strategy. We'll also share current information on local um, and national trends at quarterly roll calls, as well as provide education focus at the middle and high school levels. Improving the capacity of the coalition by strengthening the su sustainability plan of the coalition, which is a document that has already been developed by volunteers Marcy Bailey, Christy Peroni, and Laura Miranda, 
This document positions the coalition better in case we do lose federal funding. This is something we've been planning for, Dom, just in case. Next slide, Chief. Thank you. And finally, we'll continue to focus on rollover items that were delayed due to COVID-19 um, and obviously uh, some of these are going to hopefully be rectified soon and we'll be allowed to get in front of families and, and uh, the students much quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I'm gonna turn the presentation over to our mental health substance abuse clinician, Laura Miranda for a brief update. Thank you, Chief. Good morning, everybody. So in fiscal year 21, I had 159 contacts with North Reading community members. Coordinate and implemented a first responder training for personal mental health for our officers. This was based off of a New York Police Department resiliency symposium. It was presented at roll calls. Working on and continuing to work on the strengthening the relationship between this role and the North Reading Fire Department by following up on joint calls um, with the fire staff and seeking out trainings that apply to both the police and fire departments. Increasing the community awareness of the role of the mental health clinician and the resources available, the mental wellness action team is in full force. We have um, pretty diverse community representation and are meeting monthly at this point. Um, outreach is being conducted to local hospitals and partial hospitalization programs, hospitals for how this role can help community members when they're home and the PHPs for referral purposes. And then collaborating with surrounding communities who have the similar role, um, specifically Wilmington for residents who, who cross town lines at times. Next slide, Chief, please. Thank you. Going forward, um, I'd like to, as the Chief mentioned, coordinate a larger training for first responders, both for personal mental health care and their professional um, interactions with community members working on collaborating more with the youth services director and veteran services director to reach town citizens who use the support of both of those departments. And we had a pretty successful virtual self-care project in November with a, a quite a large reach via Facebook. So I'd like to do that again this year um, involving more departments. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then reaching out to local courthouses that North Reading residents use for whatever purposes they need, um, specifically around mental health or substance abuse interactions. And then taking advantage, I don't know if that's the right term, but making use of the COVID-19 pandemic with all of the resources that have become available as a result of the pandemic and letting community members know that those resources are now available and how to get them. That is all, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. In summary, our, our proposed FY22 budget reflects an increase of $159,250 or 3.9% from our appropriated FY21 budget. I believe this proposal provides the best means for our department to deliver the most efficient, effective police services to our community. Madam Chair, as the end of our presentation, I'd like to thank you, the Select Board, the Finance Committee, the Town Administrator, and our Finance Director, and the residents of our community for continued support of our department and its members. Our presenters are prepared to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Chief. All right, I'm going to actually go uh, one by one to our members of both uh, Finance Committee and uh, Select Board. And I, again, if you don't have any questions and or comments, then just you're all set. So let's begin with Mr. Walner. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'm always very impressed by the police department. And uh, I must say that I think the leadership is fantastic. Um, I think that, you know, during this year, we had, um, you know, there was issues in the country around racial justice and everything else like that. And when the rest of the country was talking about defunding the police. I was recognizing that our leadership, that our police department had already built in these resources, as we're seeing with people like Laura Miranda, Amy Luckowitz, and Officer Paul Lucci. So I really appreciate everything you've done to prepare and to be involved. And I think you've done a fantastic job. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez? 
Oh, I would like to echo my colleague, Mr. Walner's remarks. Um, can't say enough. Just, you know, great job. It's been a tough year and um, kudos to all of you. I don't really have any questions on anything. Thank you. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, again, echo the same comments as uh, Mr. Walner, but uh, again, specifically, you know, we, we've been proactive, uh, you know, with the addition of Laura and Amy, you know, into the department so that they can uh, further assist the officers on duty and the community as, as a whole. And I think it's it's a testament to uh, the leadership that we have, um, you know, at the department. And, uh, as far as the fleet, uh, apparently, if the uh, state police have uh, have tested these things as far as performance-wise and stuff. I think it's a good idea from an environmental standpoint, but I certainly want to make sure that uh, uh, they, they function well. So I'm heartened to hear that the, the hybrids are, are working well for the departments. And so that's a good uh, good thing to be engaged in too. So, but again, uh, you know, to uh, chief through you to your offices, you know, we appreciate them uh, being there every day and out there 24 seven for us. And, uh, they're standing in the community and the respect that they command is uh, well deserved. So appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. I'm going to jump over to the members of the Finance Committee and we'll go, Mr. Pulver. No questions. Nice job. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. <clears throat> Just the, the question is so, so if the, the grant for the drug free coalition isn't granted, what, what, what would be the process then for funding it? in the future. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a really good question and it's obviously something that we're very concerned about. Um, you know, the finance director, myself, the police chief, um, the uh, youth substance abuse grant coordinator, Amy, we've all been in ongoing conversations for the past few months with regard to this. And as I think you heard in the presentation, our intention is to push really hard to continue that grant through the federal program, um, not only because it's been an important resource, but because it's been so successful, I think, and that we've done such a great job with it. Unfortunately, the timing is such where we're not going to have that answer, whether it, the, the program has been continued in time for the June town meeting. And so the conversations that we have had are to um, continue through this budget process um, making decisions that will maintain flexibility in the municipal budget so that if we are not awarded the grant um, this year, we have the ability to adjust the municipal operating budget at the fall town meeting in order to continue um, the components of the program. So, so that is the approach that we are recommending to take. Um, you know, we think we have a very strong application and I think that, you know, all things being equal, we believe it would be continued, but we just won't have that decision. Um, and, um, you know, wanting to be respectful of the federal budget process, so we wouldn't want to appropriate the funding until a decision had been made at the federal level. Okay, so, so, plan, so planning for flexibility in that event going forward. Correct. That, that, great presentation, I don't know the questions, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bailey, Mr. Haggerty. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mills. Uh, no questions. I uh, appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Mr. Kelleher. Uh, no questions. A great presentation. Thank you, Michael and team. Thank you. Mrs. Hurlbeck. I don't think I can add anything other than um, this was a concise, useful, informational presentation. And thank you, Chief, and all the people that helped you do this. Thank you. And I believe that's all the members, unless anyone's joined us, right, Mrs. Herbert from mm -hmm. Finance? I, be I believe Mr. Johnson. Oh. Join. oh, great. Mr. Johnson, are you with us? I am. Thank you. Oh, no question. Um, do you have any questions, comments? No. Okay. No. Uh, I just wanted to follow up then uh, from the chair with regard to that, that um, Michael, your explanation of how we're going to be, I guess, earmarking for that, because I, I would be concerned that we, I know you said you have a mechanism, but what is that? Salary reserve? What, it, what is it that you're going to be doing? I think. 
much in the way that we maintain flexibility when we approve the fiscal year 2021 budget in June town meeting by um, being conservative with our revenue estimates. Um, you know, we would follow a similar approach. Um, we would detail exactly what that plan would be when we get to the reconciliation of the budget just before it's finalized. Um, but, um, you know, we, the intention would be to, with, without appropriating funding for the program, um, either holding it in some sort of reserve or maintaining flexibility in other budgets in order to make an adjustment at fall town meeting. And we'll review that with the financial planning team as well, Madam Chair and uh, Madam Vice Chair, and uh, Ms. Robert and Mr. Kelleher as well. Um, but uh, I think that's sort of the, uh, the thinking at this point in time. Okay, great. Because I think everybody, this is such a cohesive team and all of these individuals play such an important role in what the mission of the department is doing. We, we definitely, Amy, so value add, everybody that's pre present is, you know, such a so value added to what the mission is. So we don't we don't want to lose any one individual. And I, I did want to follow up to um, with you, Chief, uh, with regard to Mr. Walner's comments because that new reform bill came in, and I'm wondering if any of your training. It seems like you have some wonderful training programs. Are there going to be grants to be able to train on the new reform bill and things like that? Or are you proceeding with diversity training grants or anything like that? There, there are some grants that are becoming available. So the legislator and, and EOPS are now still working out all the language that's involved. Um, but a lot of what is in the reform bill, we've already had in practice for a long time as part of our accreditation process. So. I don't really see it affecting our department in a way financially, um, but certainly we are, um, you know, we we welcome any any reform um, that's going to make our profession better. That's great. I'm good, glad to hear that. That's great. And um, I just wanted to, in conclusion, echo the comments of my colleagues with regard to just the outstanding job you've done. This has been one of the most difficult years. And I, I'm, I'm so glad to see that your our, uh, mental health coordinator is incorporating in some things for your members too, because we, we just expect you to go out there, handle these emergency scenarios, handle everything. And we forget you need, you need some of that assistance as well. So I'm so glad to see that's worked in there. And um, I think that's as far as Thank you. Just thank you. Thank, thank you to your members. Thank you. Michael, do you have anything else? Mr. Gilberto, anything else? But no, Madam Chair, uh, I do not. Uh, I, I believe our, our next uh, department, the fire department is on and the chief staff right. is, is here. I see him there actually. Good morning, Chief. Good morning. Morning, Chief. Morning, Chief. Morning, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. Just uh, for those who may have joined uh, the meeting um, prior to the opening, um, again, I will just reiterate that because of the fact that departments were asked to really uh, scale back their operating budget requests for this year due to the economic uncertainty and the fact that we are forced into uh, the virtual forum, um, the fire department, um, as was the police department, was asked to abbreviate its presentation for fiscal year 2022 budget and the chief has done so. Um, he will go through the slides in the, in the normal format that we do. And as you stated, um, I believe we're gonna take questions um, at the end. Um, and for those viewing at home who may have just tuned in again, as I stated earlier, on the homepage of the website at www.northreadingma.gov is a link on town news that will take you right to the entire municipal departmental operating budget request document, um, which includes the fire department budget. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. All right, welcome Chief, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair, let me share my screen. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, Select Board and members of the FinCom. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the North Reading Fire Department's fiscal year 2022 budget request, and I am the Fire Chief, Don Stats. 
I'd just like to open with a general budget statement. Uh, the North Reading Fire Department is committed to providing the citizens of North Reading with a continued level of excellence for our ambulance suppression, inspection, and general services that the community is accustomed to. We strive to accomplish this continued level of excellence through a fiscally responsible level of budgeting that is not only transparent and efficient, but delivers value to the community whom we are accountable to. I'd like to review some of my goals that we've achieved as a department and also calls that we responded to uh, during FY21. Um, some of the goals that we were able to accomplish in FY21 include <clears throat> an organized department training program in which we have scheduled monthly group training and quarterly department-wide training, as well as completing all mandated OSHA and DLS uh, required training. Due to the COVID pandemic, quarterly department training was postponed. And as the chief indicated, we were in discussions about uh, conducting joint uh, rescue task force training that had to be postponed. Uh, we implemented the Lexapol policy management software platform, allowing us to digitize our current policies and procedures and more easily manage and modify them. This platform allows all members to have the most recent version of these policies immediately. We implemented a soft uh, checklist software program in which we complete our daily truck and equipment checks. And in coordination with the building superintendent, the asbestos was abated and second floor improvements that had begun several years ago have been completed. And i uh, just like to really tip my hat to the building superintendent uh, who stuck to a pretty hard timeline and everything went off without a hitch. Uh, we also conduct, excuse me, applied for the FEMA SAFER and AFG grants for additional staffing and equipment. We instituted an online open burning permitting system, making the process of obtaining an open burning permit much more efficient for both the fire department and the residents. And we developed and rolled out a new official fire department website in association with JGPR Inc, which includes a customer satisfaction survey to better gauge our level of service to the community. <clears throat> in calendar year 2020, the North Reading Fire Department responded to a total of 2,383 calls for service. Of those calls, the fire department responded to 37 fires, four overheated appliances, 1,342 medical aids, 145 hazardous conditions that required further investigation, 314 service calls, 224 good intent calls, 287 false alarms, 24 weather related calls, and four special incidents. Of the 1,342 medical emergencies the fire department responded to, 957 of those resulted in medical transports to hospital emergency rooms. 446 at the paramedic level and 511 at the basic EMT level. As you can see, the numbers in parentheses, these are last year's numbers for your, uh, a more easier way for you to compare uh, the numbers between the two years. Of the 957 transports, the fire department collected $730,000 of 938,000 allowed by contract and um, insurance agreements which resulted in a 77.79% collection rate. The Comstar billing fee for that period totaled just under $35,000, and our total cost recovery for that time period was $695,000. Over a 10-year span, the number of our medical transports have increased significantly. And while we were down by about 11% compared to last year, transports are up by almost 27% over the over the 10 year span that you see before you. This graph illustrates the fire department's ambulance receipts since 2010. And as you can see, corresponding to our slightly lower transport count, our ambulance receipts for the current period reflect the same uh, dip. So what does, what does this mean and translate on a call by call basis? So this is a breakdown of a per call um, cost recovery rate. So of the $980,000 uh, <clears throat> allowed by contract, this breaks down into us being able to collect $980, $980 per call. Of that, we've collected 762. Our costs out in yellow are 239.50 in overtime to cover the station while that's all occurring. 
and we're transporting. Our working costs, including the Comstar billing fee, training of individuals and maintenance of the vehicles, which allows us to net 458, almost $459 per call. So during that time period, that was just our total cost recovery was just shy of $440,000 net of all fees and uh, overtime associated with that. We also conducted 509 inspections. 240 of those were smoke detectors, uh, totaling $6,000 in fees. We issued 246 permits, totaling $8,600 in fees and billed for 112 master boxes. Uh, so total fees collected during that time period for these services was $47,980. <clears throat> in talking about our mutual aid responses, total mutual aid calls in calendar year 20 resulted in North Reading providing 183 responses and receiving aid 100 times. Of those 183 responses that North Reading provided, 130 of those resulted in medical transports by our ambulance to local hospitals with the following breakdown. We went to Andover five times, transported from Middleton 18 times, Wilmington 34 times, and Reading 70 times. We have three other outliers that I did not include in this graph, which would total 130, and those were anomalies that I don't expect to reoccur again and one-offs. So why we're here today. So now I'd like to get to the budget request for the fire department for fiscal year 22. The fire department is here today to request funding in fiscal year 22 for $3,829,800, which is broken down in the following divisions. Operations of $3,587,270, which is a 3.6% increase over FY21, resulting in an addition of $123,886. Fire alarm, $38,000, which is a 3.3% decrease from FY21. Our EMS division requesting $166,250, which is a 4.8% decrease from FY21. And the call department, 36800 which is no change, and requesting $1,500 in the mechanic division, which is to upgrade software that, for a scanning device that both police and fire use. So the to total budget request of $3,829,820 represents a 3.1% increase over FY21, or $114,259. And in summarizing that, the majority of that uh, increase is due to overtime costs associated with uh, training two potential new hires due to two likely retirements at FY22. Some of the goals that, we, that I hope to achieve in FY22 are continued training and implementing pre-COVID quarterly department drills, uh, in, implementing a pre-incident planning and response software, transitioning to an updated records management system, ensuring OSHA and DLS compliance are maintained, development of a comprehensive infection control officer position and plan, implementation of an EMS quality assurance quality improvement program. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is a day officer position, which I know you've heard me uh, over the last two budget presentations speak about. I am requesting to add another administrative officer's position in the day who would function primarily as the fire prevention officer for the town. I'm here to request this position due to the real need in the department for another designated full-time administrative officer during the day due to the amount of responsibilities and duties that are required of the chief and the deputy chief's position. The current organization of the fire department consists of four groups with a captain and four fighter, firefighters on each group that work 24 hour shifts in a one on, one off, one on, five off schedule. A deputy chief who works Monday through Thursday, 7.30 to 
7.30 to 5.30, and every fifth Friday, those same hours, and an administrative assistant who works Monday through Thursday, 8 to 4, and Fridays, 8 to 1. And I, who am on call 24-7, but have office hours Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. This would be the organizational chart with the day officer included. And reviewing the reasons why we need to really look at the responsibilities of each position a little bit further. So the deputy chief in the North Ring Fire Department is responsible for the following duties, supervision of personnel, incident management, policy development, emergency response, daily operational oversight, acting chief when required, training, and fire prevention. Each of these listed responsibilities have further sub-responsibilities or continuing education requirements, but none more than what is required for the fire prevention officer today. Depending on the week, 60 to 80% of the deputy chief's workload consists of fire prevention responsibilities. The day officer's responsibilities would include, but not be limited to the following, fire prevention, being part of the incident management team during times when we need to stand up the incident management system, data management through our records management systems, liaisoning both internally and externally with other departments, permitting, pre-incident planning of buildings and various other administrative activities as needed. While several of the day officer's responsibilities overlap and would assist the chief and deputy chief, none more important than fire prevention. Fire prevention officers are a key component to creating and ensuring a safe community while working synergistically with both building and health inspectors through comprehensive pre-construction building plan reviews, on-site compliance inspections, and code enforcement. Fire prevention officers are expected to be proficient and are responsible for inspections, building plan reviews, code enforcement, issuing permits, continuing education, educating the public on fire prevention best practices with at-risk groups, liaisoning and maintaining good working relationships with building, health and police departments to solve isolated community issues, and other delegated duties from the chief or deputy chief. While I have not captured this new position within my FY22 budget request, I cannot complete my goals without it and consider it a level service request in that if I do not receive the position, other work will not be completed in a timely manner. The first year costs associated with a new position total approximately $185,000 due to equipping and training another new hire and would increase my FY22 budget request to $4,015,717. This would decrease in following years to a reoccurring approximate annual cost of $86,000. Again, just to be clear, this new position is not currently in my FY22 budget request, but I'm highly recommending it to be included. Our current fire prevention officer could retire. I don't know what happened now, excuse me. Can you guys see the screen? Yes. Okay, I lost it. So give me one second. Sorry for that. So our current fire prevention officer could retire in under two years and it is imperative that I have a seamless transition as possible in those duties and responsibilities, which require many hours of on the job classroom training for the continued safety of the community. The slide represents a breakdown in the associated costs with the new personnel as far as training and equipping. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present the North Reading Fire Department's fiscal year 2022 budget request. Madam Chair, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Does um, anybody have any questions? Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'll st start off with the members of 
uh, uh, select board. Mr. Waller. Again, I'd like to say that, you know, I follow the news and hear things about how your department is doing and it's always been very professional. I appreciate that you're always emphasizing training. It's, a, it's and you have to cover many, you have to wear many hats to do that. So it's always uh, very important. Prevention, I think is really critical. So, um, and obviously in your stats chart, you're showing less fire calls, which is, you know, an outcome of that. Um, just a question for you. Um, you gave us a lot of stats, but it's a little, if you're not intimately involved, it's a little hard to understand what the trends are. So I, I guess I'm just asking for a general commentary. Maybe everybody can benefit from it. Can you comment on the trends of some of the stats you mentioned and things that you're concerned about or things that you feel are, uh, you know, uh, good records for the department? So just in general, just on some of the stats, if you can uh, give us, you know, some big view on that, that would be very helpful from my end. Thank you. Sure, I think, well, predominantly as the, as the, the chart shows and it's the same most years, you know, 50% or over 50% of our calls are, are EMS related. So without all that being said, you know, we, we tend to focus a lot on EMS. However, what happens with those lower frequency type events, they require more training for us to be as proficient and safe to operate in. So while fire calls are down, we're actually pretty busy in the mutual aid business. And, uh, and also we've had three structure fires within or significant structure fires within the, the town, you know, over the fiscal year. So, you know, our trends, to your point, Mr. Warner, tend to focus on EMS. Okay. And um, any comment, I know overtime was brought up in the police department, any commentary on how our overtime is doing in this department? Sure, our overtime is, is, is on track uh, this year and last year, and actually over the last three fiscal years. Um, my request actually was heavily uh, based in overtime, but only due to the fact that we have to potentially plan for two new hires, which require the bulk of that overtime. If we didn't have that in there, uh, my request would have been actually less, a little bit less than last year. Okay. Again, my, my questions are just, just to learn a little bit more about the department. Again, I think it's, you've done a fantastic job and uh, um, you know, very proud of what you've been doing for the community. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Chief, for that. Um, and also, I would like to thank you and your whole department. And, um, you know, kudos also to you for a tough year. Um, I would just like to clarify that day officer position. Um, you commented, so there's a fire prevention officer already, right? Correct? We have our fire prevention officer is our deputy chief. Okay. So he wears both hats. Exactly, and, and a lot of his duties revolve around fire prevention, which takes him away from dealing with other issues that he has to deal with or he can help me with, which allows, frees me up. So it, it's a trickle down effect. So by having this extra position, I, I really feel we'd be a lot more efficient and we could be um, accomplishing more in a more timely manner. So would that position take that whole fire prevention duty to that one person? No, he would primarily uh, take those duties once he was trained. However, the deputy chief would still, would still assist, but it would not be his primary role anymore. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying you're that. You're welcome. That's all. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. O'Leary? Morning, Chief. Morning, sir. The, um, and again, to uh, all of the firefighters and your entire department, again, you have Terrific job and under difficult circumstances of this past year. Uh, first and foremost, we have, as far as uh, personal uh, protective equipment, supplies are fine for for our firefighters. And yes, they are, sir. Thank you for asking. We uh, we actually just uh, received new turnout gear, um, which is excellent, excellent equipment. You know, it's one thing that I can honestly say that we've always uh, had great support and getting funding requested for our gear and equipment. So we thank you for that. Right. And then as far as the, the, the day officer position, uh, would this be above a firefighter rank? Would it be an equivalent to a captain rank or is it somewhere in between firefighter and captain? Or how are you planning on budgeting for that? 
So my recommendation is that it come in as a, as a captain. However, that still is up for discussion. Okay. And then in relation to the uh, grant application that you're, you're working on here, and if we have an influx of, uh, of new firefighters, uh, there's nothing reflected in this particular budget for um, a change in structure in relation to whether it be shift changes or uh, uh, senior officer positions like lieutenants, which we don't have. Uh, would that come into effect should the grant application be granted? Is that on the radar screen? Yes, it is, sir. So if we were fortunate enough to receive a safer grant and the town was likely to accept it, I do have a, a, a rough outline on how I want to see the department structured and restructured with additional lieutenants positions, because at that point, due to span of control, we need to break down those companies a little bit more and have supervision at lower levels. And then, you know, you, you haven't uh, laid out yet, although we've talked about it over the years here, again, restructuring and adding additional personnel, even if there isn't any grant money, um, no inclination to, to lay that out yet, apparently. Um, if we add additional personnel at some point, would we be talking about changing shifts in relation to more office, more firefighters on duty during the day, rather than the 24 seven shifts that we currently operate under? Well, I think, I think that I would take a good look at that to see where the trends are as far as all volume and see what we needed to, if we needed to beef up anything in there or add a different day shift. But I also think that that's a conversation that needs to be had because I can't just change the 24 seven structure that we now have without a conversation with the, the firefighters union. I understand, but I mean, if we had more personnel, I mean, would, would it not make some sense to have day shift people so that we could uh, effectuate some of the changes you're talking about with the day officer and some of those responsibilities? Because some of those responsibilities now are being assumed by shift personnel, correct? Yes, yeah, some of the, the smoke detector inspections, some of the follow-up inspections, they are being done by shift personnel. And that, that would continue to happen even with the fire prevention officer in place where they would supplement and do fire smoke detector types inspections. The fire prevention officer, especially with all the construction that's currently going on and projected to go on, would be extremely busy uh, just in making sure that everything was in compliance in that regard especially over the next several years. Um, so I don't foresee the shifts not doing smoke detector type inspections still, um, but in gaining this position, I can honestly say that he will have his work cut out for him and the deputy chief would, I'm sure would still be assisting in a more limited capacity, of course, once he was trained up, but uh, there's gonna be enough work for, for, for those positions. Again, thank you very much for your presentation and, uh, and, again, and again, your uh, thoughtful operations on a daily basis uh, of the department. I know it's challenging uh, with the number of personnel that we have and we could use more and uh, I appreciate all your efforts and the efforts of all the firefighters, so thank you. Thank you, I'll pass it on. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Okay, we're gonna jump over to FinCom. Ms. Mr. Bailey, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't, great presentation, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hegarty? Do we lose Mr. Hegarty? All right, Mr. Mills. Uh, no specific questions at this time. Thank you for the uh, presentation, Chief. Thank you. Mr. Kelleher? Uh, no questions now, uh, good presentation. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Mr. Pulver? Uh, yes, hi, Chief Stats. Uh, did uh, COVID protocols affect your operating expenses looking back or looking forward? You know, they did. Um, they did, however, through cost recovery with the finance committee or finance department rather, I think we weren't impacted greatly. So our budget, you know, our budget and our operation did not suffer due to COVID. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Mr. Johnson? No questions, a fine presentation. Thank you. Mrs. Herbert. Um, yeah, I have a brief question, Chief. Uh, the collection rate on ambulance um, fees was 77 point something percent. 
correct. I realize that Medicare's contribution has gone down, but I'm assuming that the percentage, the collection rate is based on number of invoices or bills that went out that are collected. Um, I know that over the years we've had somewhat of a difficulty collecting 100%, but 77 seems a little bit lower. Could you please compare this percentage to that of last year? Sure, I believe that we are about 6% lower than last year. If I have that right, if I don't, I will get that number back to you because I don't have those figures in front of me. Nice presentation, thanks Chief. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a few questions. Uh, Chief Stats, obviously the numbers are, I would assume the numbers are lower this year because people aren't out on the road and people aren't, you know, driving anywhere in their home and they're more, you know, aware of what's going on in their homes, right? So that number is really more related to COVID. I'm assuming that's why that number is decreased. Not because you're not collecting the revenue, but because the number of calls that you you told us have decreased. Well, number of calls have decreased, but the collection rate was based on those number of calls. So Ms. Hurlbutt's question is a fair one. It's just that I believe we just we have not been as robust in collecting this current fiscal year as we have in the past for whatever reason. Um, we have a system in place with Comstar to expedite that collection process. Um, but that's that's that was the trend this year for, for that whatever reason. Um, our calls for service, our EMS calls for service, were actually down only eight runs uh, in total, but our total number of transports was down about a hundred and six. And I think that was due to COVID because people did not want to go to the hospital even after they called us to their house. They really did not want to be transported. Uh, they did not want to take a chance on, on contracting the disease. Okay, so then just to follow up on, on Mrs. Herbert's question then, what are you doing in terms of, what, it, what can you do with Comstar in terms of, you know, shoring up the collections, collecting more than what? Sure, so right now, I mean, we have, we have a process in place that requires two letters and then notification to um, a collection agency. Um, we have not pulled the trigger on third party collections, although we have discussed it. So that's something that I can go back to them and review and talk about with the town administrator to see if that's something that he recommends we do at this point. We have opted not to go to a third party collection agency because Comstar recommended it uh, highly against it. They said that at the point that that would come into place, their experience with that is that they only really collect 10%. Um, of what they actually are trying to collect, which what really wasn't worth it after the collection fees were uh, divided up amongst the entities. Also, you know, what's important to note as well with that collection rate is that some of those collections are ongoing. So at the current point, it's 77.9. However, up to, uh, up to six months from the point of that person's transport, they're still attempting to collect and paying out from the insurance company. Okay, I have, a, I have just two more questions. When you respond to, uh, uh, when your members respond to, for example, an accident scene where there's someone at fault, are you billing their insurance carrier for the costs of um, going to that scene and what costs are incurred by the department, cleanup and crew costs and things like that? No, at this point we are not. We are only billing for uh, actually, if we transport somebody. Okay. Okay. I have a question and follow up to on the day officer position. In the slide that you showed us, it looks like, and it's, I think it's more of more following up with Mr. O'Leary's question. The day officer looks like the day officer in the hierarchy would be under the deputy chief. In so, terms of um, oh, supervisory, I'm sorry, you moved over to the <laughs> right hand. <laughs> In terms of the supervisory responsibility, that day order officer would that day officer be uh, in in lateral in the hierarchy to other firefighters, or would that 
day officer, you proposing that day officer would have supervisory authority over other firefighters? That day officer would have supervisory authority over other firefighters, but not over other same rank officers. So my, I recommended to come in as a captain. He okay. would be equal to those other captains. However, in the structure, that's where he would fit in as far as the four shift captains are with their groups and the in the organizational chart and he fits in underneath the deputy chief it shows him above the shift captains however he's actually equal to and i could put him equal to however in that structure that's how the chain of command would work for talking to or speaking to giving orders from all right so that in other words that day officer would be a ranking officer that would be my recommendation okay and then my final question had to do with your your um your mutual aid, your your mutual aid calls mm -hmm. um, to other communities, and in the slide prior to that, when you were um, when you were showing us the reimbursement that you're able to collect on that, it seems like at least two of the other communities we're responding to pretty significantly: Reading and Wilmington. Um, and does Reading actually have an ambulance contract with someone, or? Do they have an ambulance service that they use besides North Reading? Yes, so they they run one ambulance uh, from their from for the town at any one time. They do not put a second ambulance in service, and that's something that we do. So we staff our second ambulance with callback personnel. So should a second call come in, we still respond, and we don't have to call mutual aid. Reading doesn't do that, and they respond. Or excuse me, they call for mutual aid on second medical aids while their ambulance is out. So what's interesting about the numbers is that generally it's a three to one and almost a four to one ratio between them calling us and us calling them. Uh, they call us four times more, almost four times more. This year it was a two to one ratio. Exact, it was 80 times and 40 times. So it was uh, interesting to see how things changed throughout the years. Okay, and in terms of the slide that you showed um, for how much we're able to collect back for those runs and our overtime costs or our call time costs, do, do, did that include all the mutual aid calls? Yes, when you did that percentage that incorporated in all the mutual aid calls to all the different communities? It did, and what's interesting and probably speaks to uh, one of Ms. Her or Ms. Herbert's question also is that the collection rate for the mutual aid calls was actually lower. So it probably dragged our overall percentage rate down a little bit in town. So for whatever reason, the mutual aid collection rate was slightly lower. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Chief. And if there's no, my, Mr. Gopardi, do you have any other? Oh, Mr. O'Leary. Just in relation to follow up on the, uh, on the collection rate, um, I would think that the high percentage of what we collect is from insurance companies of Medicaid, or Medicare or something like that, right? Yes. So that, you know, the, the fall off is not because we're anticipating getting uh, co-pays or anything from, from individuals themselves. No, that's correct, Mr. Rollary. A lot of times the insurance companies will wait to actually pay on a claim. And that's what delays sometimes that collection rate, which is why, as you can see through the years, I use a lot of the times I'll use calendar year instead of fiscal year because it brings us a lot closer to this budget presentation and a lot more accurate as far as numbers go. Yeah, I just don't understand why the insurance companies are delinquent and paying, you know, um, someone got transported, someone got transported and they have a responsibility to pay the, pay the bill. And, and certainly there's an incentive for Comstar to collect because they get a a small piece of the action yeah. also, correct? So it's, uh, it, just, it would, would seem unlikely that the collection rates would drop unless insurance companies are going out of business, which they're not. So <laughs> it's, uh, I just find it unusual uh, that, it, that it's dropped 6%, that's significant. Yeah, so. Uh, Maybe it's timing, but. Uh, yeah, again, you know, that, that collection rate number, <clears throat> excuse me, is a moving target because people from, people that we've transported from August could still be paying up through our process that we use. 
So that number can still fluctuate. I mean, we, we kind of established a policy, but we're actually not chasing individuals and putting them in collection for their co-pays. Correct. Uh, so I, I just find it uh, interesting that insurance companies aren't paying mm. on a timely basis. Well, they're, timely, they're never timely, but, um, but it should just be cyclical anyway. All right, so thank you. All right, thank you, Chief. If there's no further questions, thank you. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Kelleher. I see the hand and you're waving, so. Thanks. Uh, just a, just a, a follow-up question on your, your last comment, because it confused me. Um, if I heard you correctly, the collection rate on mutual aid calls is lower than in-town calls, and I've just, do we is the billing done differently? Does no, the billing is done the same way, sir. For whatever reason, that's how the numbers came from. The numbers came from Comstar, and that's what they were. That's what they stated. They were, they were slightly lower than our in-town collection rate. That's strange. Yeah. Is is there a difference in in how we forward the call information to Comstar so that they can collect it versus what our mutual aid towns are doing with with respect to our, our assistance? No, everything is the same. Huh. Okay. All right. Just strange. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. Chief, did you want to say anything? Anything else? Mrs. Herlbert? Um, yeah, I'm assuming that uh, Whatever, whatever town does the transport is billed to the transportees insurance. However, if you're doing um, a transport call for Reading, is there any way of uh, looking at the possibility of Reading paying you directly and then they're going to the insurance company or is that an impossibility since North Reading transport? Yeah, so that's that's exactly right, uh, Ms. Roll, but it, it, I, anything is possible. However, that's how all of our mutual aid communities function. If they transport their billing, um, we, we used to cost share with several communities and we stopped doing that because it was too confusing for the billing companies to divide up and split things 50%. And what we do now is just bill directly. Um, if we transport, we bill 100%. If we're in transports, they bill 100%. We could probably save money buying Reading a second ambulance. <laughs> so, yes. All right. Well, let's not add that into the budget right now. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Chief. Thank you for everything that your department does for the town. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Select Board, and thank you, members of the FinCom. Thank you, Chief. All right, so next up is our other public safety division, which is our public works. And we have the entire team joining us. So, uh, Mr. Deming, why don't, oh, Mr. Hang on, Mr. Deming, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, just uh, for the third time, the public safety, uh, public service announcement uh, for those who are watching at home or have just joined us via Zoom. Um, the Department of Public Works, like the Police and Fire Department, was asked to abbreviate its presentation due to the um, anticipated uh, limitation on funds for the fiscal year 22 and 23 budgets. That, coupled with the virtual forum that we're in this morning, um, has caused uh, for the, the presentation to be abbreviated. The entire budget document is online at the town's website on the homepage at northreadingma.gov. And uh, Madam Chair, as you previously stated, I believe the intention is to take questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. And through you, I'll turn it over to Mr. Deming. Sure. Welcome, Mr. Deming. Good morning, Madam Chair, Select Board and Finance Committee. I'm Chris Deming, the Interim DPW Director. Today I'm joined by John Cookbell, the Town Engineer, Mark Clark, the Water Superintendent, and Mark Hamill, the Building Superintendent. And this is our FY22 budget presentation. Can everybody see that? Uh, not yet, Mr. Deming.
Also, while you're pulling that up, you have your executive assistant, Amy's on with us too. Amy Deshar is on with us. Morning, Amy. Another member of your team. So the Department of Public Works is broken down into administration, engineering, road and street, snow and ice, street lights, tree care, machinery maintenance, cemetery, storm water, town buildings, water, sanitation, and fuel. Before I get into the operating budget, I would like to make a couple updates. Um, the first one I'm pretty excited about. Uh, in, F in FY20, the fire department was approved to replace their rescue two. Um, they were only offered $3,000 toward the trade. Uh, Deputy Galvin had reached out to myself. Uh, we had several discussions regarding repurposing this truck, um, specifically for the DPW to maximize its, its useful life for the town in North Reading. The DPW and the water department successfully converted a 2010 ambulance into a fully stocked water main and utility repair vehicle. Uh, the DPW had the truck's emergency lighting switched over, so there's, there's no red flashing lights. The siren's been removed. The truck was re-lettered. Um, we've upfitted with the tools and supplies that we need and use to repair, repair water main brakes and service leaks. The truck has been utilized several times since being put into service. I believe it was about late summer, early fall when, when we finally got it up and running. And uh, it has greatly increased our speed and efficiency during emergency repairs. Uh, we can... Pretty much any type of uh, water main break that could happen, we we have the tools on board and the and the uh, equipment to to repair it uh, all on this one truck. Uh, it has a lot of scene lighting. It has auxiliary power, um, so we can pretty much show up to a job with this one truck, and uh, you know just we have everything in one spot. So it was a uh, it was a great great uh, outreach by the fire department, and I'm glad that we were able to switch this this over and get into service. Uh, another update that I wanted to make was on uh, also in FY20, the DPW was approved to purchase a new light duty dump truck. This is a 2020 F550. And what makes this truck unique over our other plow trucks is it, as you can see, has two plows. Um, the front plow and then the side plow is called a wing plow. Um, this truck, these type of trucks are used a little bit more uh, up north. Um, down in Mass, they're not as common. Um, We've been looking at them for a while. So we were able to purchase this. The, what's nice about this truck is it has the capability of plowing uh, pretty much what two trucks could do in a pass. So this truck can go out and plow an entire plow route by itself. Uh, that means one guy, one truck, one fuel tank, one set of repairs. And uh, you know, after after getting this truck and putting it into service, uh, we feel that for the uh, one ton style dump trucks going forward, we plan to continue to buy this style truck. So our budget preview, uh, the DPW budget is uh, just a little over $2.7 million. It's an increase of $266,265. It's a 10% increase. The fuel budget overall increase is 16,837, which is about 12.3%. Sanitation is an increase of about 70, oh, just shy of $73,000 or 5.73%. And the water budget is increase of 91,827, which is an overall increase of 2.8%. So breaking down the DPW side of things, um, there's a, a $6,000 increase in administration. Uh, this is tied into personnel contracts. Uh, there's a few things that uh, we were, we bumped up the, uh, the line items for, uh, we have a new time clock system down at the DPW garage. There's um, a new system that we're using involving uh, iPads for tracking the, the snow plow, the sander use and uh, GPSing on the sander trucks. So there's a contract involved with that. And then there was a couple small decreases in supplies uh, based on pass use. The engineering division was uh, actually decreased by a little less than $2,000 um, based on past use. There are two small capital requests built into this budget, uh, one for an upgrade to the GPS unit 
which would enable us to hone in on, on when we use the GPS unit for, for marking out utilities in town. The one that we have now is, I believe, within a few, a few feet, and uh, we'd like to get something that's a little bit more accurate. The other small capital request is an upgrade to the town's drone. Um, as of right now, the, we have the drones used for DPW services, uh, inspectional services when needed. So we're just looking to upgrade the camera on that to make it a little bit more user friendly. The road and street budget has been uh, increased. Um, the majority of this increase is based on personnel services to fill a few vacant positions and reflect personal contracts. The rest of the budget ended up being level funded. We had a few small decreases, uh, which kind of leveled out with a few increases throughout the line items. The Snow and ice budget, as you may know, the every year is funded uh, the same at one hundred and seventy five thousand uh, dollars. Last year we had spent just over three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I believe there was about thirty five, thirty six inches of snow last year. This year, currently, we're at about $440,000 and not including what's going on right now, I believe we're at about 61 inches of snow for the year. The streetlight budget increased uh, by about 3% 3, 3 that was based on uh, reports and forecasts from uh, RMLD. The tree care we increased by about just shy of 10%. It was a $4,000 increase. We saw uh, a decent level of increased uh, requests for hazardous tree removal. Um, we think part of that has to do with a lot of people being home over the past year, people noticing things a lot more as they're walking around town. So that was increased slightly to reflect the past calls. Machinery maintenance, this budget was increased. Um, some of the others based on personal services and personal contracts. Uh, there was a little bit of reorganizing that I did um, throughout the line items, just ba based on uh, past and current use of, of different line items. And then there was an overall increase of repairs and maintenance for about five and a half percent based on our, our ever aging fleet. Seven, cemetery and grounds was increased. Um, for the personal services and personal contracts. There was uh, an increase over services and supplies. This is the pretty much the first uh, one and a half, two full years that the cemetery department has been fully staffed in, in probably five or six years. Um, so it's it's pretty common, you know, we finally have uh, three full-time guys out there, more work's getting completed, uh, more machines are breaking. Um, we've had a slight increase in burials over the last year which you know translate into more grass seed and fertilizer and things of that nature. There's also several small capital requests built into this budget. Um, I believe the cart and the small UTV for $15,000 has been on the radar for several years now. Uh, one of the lawn mowers that they currently run all summer long is in pretty rough shape, it needs to be re um, replaced. Uh, they do have three mowers I believe the oldest one right now is about a 2004. So 17 year old mow or something that runs every day during the good weather, uh, it's, it's time to replace that. We've also put in a $20,000 request. Uh, some of you may know there's a couple of Jersey barriers out in front of the Riverside Cemetery. Um, that wall that's out front, there are a few spots that are in need of repair. Uh, we believe that we can make some temporary, you know, really secure temporary repairs to that wall. And the other part is the expansion project. Uh, there's two new sections that are in the far back corner of the Riverside Cemetery, which will need to be uh, graded and loomed and the driveways paved. Um, so this is just a, you know, some money to start that project and get that going for this year. The town buildings budget um, was increased based on personal services and purchase of supplies. There are also several small capital items that were requested. One of them is the ramp at the Damon Tavern. There is a, I believe a large capital request to do some work at this building. Uh, we believe the ramp itself, we could probably do, we will do in-house. So there's a small 
capital request for the supplies for that job. The Pax Barbent IT mini split is a uh, heating and AC unit that would, I believe, complete the town hall. These have been installed throughout the town hall. Uh, this is one area that's still in need. Um, the IT area, as you may know, the uh, machines, the computers in there, they, can, they, they need to be cooled off and that area needs to be taken care of. There's also a $20,000 request for the senior center stairs. Um, I think years and years of, of patchwork for, for the front of that building has come to an end. And we've realized now that those, the stairs and the walkway out front of that building uh, just needs to be completely redone. And also uh, repairs to the heating and hot water system at the police department. It's an ongoing issue. Um, I believe since shortly after the building was, was built, um, we've put quite a bit of money into repairing that system. Uh, there's some aspects of it that we'd like to just replace and, and pretty much be done with it. There's an increase to stormwater um, based on personal contracts, a uh, small increase in personal services based on past use and the need to complete the MS4 permits, and a small decrease to um, supplies based on past use. Sanitation, uh, I know we've talked about this several times with the board and the finance committee. So the increase that we're showing for FY22 is pretty much based on the increase of the most recent contract with Covanta, the tipping fees significantly go up in FY22. We've also recently uh, been in, in negotiations with JRM. I believe we're very close to signing a five-year agreement with them for the hauling and recycling. Um, that contract with them does not reflect an increase in FY22. So the need for the increase uh, in all of sanitation right now is basically based on the disposal fee of our trash. And there's a 12% increase on the fuel. Uh, we look every year at the US Energy Information Administration. We reach out to our vendors and look for projections. Um, obviously, with, with everything going on in the country right now, it's extremely hard to project where fuel prices, gas prices are going to be for the upcoming year. Uh, but based on what we had heard from, from several different sources, uh, we take those numbers and, and we, we look at past usage by all the departments. And uh, we believe this is, the, this is the number for the budget to handle fuel for FY22. So the next slide is actually a breakdown of the water budget, which I'm going to ask um, Mark Clark, the water superintendent, to handle. Mark. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, what we're showing here is last year's budget, which that budget basically was put in before we had the PCAS issue uh, and before we transitioned to 100% of our water supply from the end over. So the FY22 budget is kind of been realigned to reflect the actual cost of 100% supply by the end of the budget. So as you can see, some line item uh, personnel we decreased kind of significantly. Uh, we have two, currently have two vacant water teams in operator position. We're not looking to fill them and subsequently we're looking to take the, uh, the funding for those two positions and transfer it to the expense side of the budget. Um, obviously the purchase of water costs will go up, but other costs within the expense side, such as energy, uh, if we're not pumping water, we're not using as much electricity, we're not heating our facility to as high a temperature as we were in the past. Uh, professional services, such as redeveloping wells or having people come in and service equipment at the water treatment plant, that cost went down, the cost of water testing, and then obviously the cost of supplies for things such as chemicals are decreased. Um, so overall, the budget increase is about $104,000. That represents about a 2.7% increase over FY21 budget. Um, I'm not making a rate presentation now, but obviously if the costs go up 2.7%, we need to cover that somewhere. If we were just to do a flat rate across the board, that would be about a 2.7% increase. And no fancy math there. This does not include the, uh, the changes to debt service. Historically, we don't have debt service numbers at this time of year. That usually comes closer to the town meeting time. Um, and I just wanted to throw a note that 
the retained earnings are currently about $2.8 million in the water department. Um, this budget does not look to touch those retained earnings at all. It's strictly a rate based budget as it has been before. Thank you. So the next couple slides are just a kind of a summary of everything on one page. This is the personnel services, the DPW, including water. So overall from last year, it's 3.5% increase. The expense budget also including water. This doesn't, these numbers do not include small capital, but the entire budget overall is 6.5%. And a recap of the small capital requests from engineering, cemetery, parks and grounds, and town buildings. And before I wrap up, I would also like to just make mention, um, as some of you may know, I've been the interim director since uh, last June. Um, I've also been the operations manager doing both jobs. And I'd just like to uh, really say that how much I appreciate the, the, the effort that everybody on the DPW has put in over the last year. Um, the staff at Town Hall, the girls in the office, and, and all the guys down at the garage. Um, it's definitely a team effort to, to be able to get the entire town taken care of the way that we do. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deming. All right, we're going to uh, take, we're going to go start out with the select board for questions. Mr. Walner. Yeah, uh, just comments, actually. Just um, comments. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez and I had a chance to work uh, to work on uh, contract negotiations with Chris and the union. And it was a real chance, you know, over the multiple meetings to get to know the department better and know what they're doing. So I've been very impressed by the fact that the uh, department has been very uh, nimble in meeting needs. And so a good example is when COVID hit, um, you know, when we see plexiglass and various uh, uh, shields have been put up around the, the town halls and various public areas. It's often as a result of the DPW taking on the task as opposed to farming it out to contractors or things of that nature. So they did a significant amount to put those safety measures in place uh, quickly and uh, without us having to go out to other contractors at more expense and delays. So I've been impressed by the nimbleness of doing that. I've been impressed by the fact that when things break in town, they're out there 24 seven um, fixing things. We had a water break in my own community. I know they were there overnight and they stay there until it gets fixed. And I've also been impressed that Chris has been um, uh, trying to get the staff to become more professionalized. They're increasing their capabilities through licensing and it's a way to expand the, uh, the duties of the department. I'll add one extra thing. Um, is that they are now in the future, he didn't mention it, but they're planning to take on more vehicle maintenance of both the police and fire departments as well, and to build in more, um, again, quicker service and uh, a, a huge savings for us because maintenance of those vehicles is expensive to farm out. So overall, I'm just very impressed with the department and I have no questions. Thank you for a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez? Again, I will echo Mr. Walner. He made a lot of the points that I was going to make and um, he's right. We, we got to know um, the department a little, a lot better working on those negotiations. And I just, you know, can't say enough about this department and Mr. Deming's leadership. Um, I think he's been a great, great role that he's played in this. Um, and I think it was a, a great presentation and I really don't have any questions. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, again, just to echo, and, and nimble is a good word. You know, nimble is a good word for the Department of Public Works because they have to be, in, uh, they do things uh, very efficiently on a moment's notice and they do a terrific job for us. And uh, I think they're sort of like the un, un, unsung heroes in the community as far as uh, public servants, because, you know, we tend to take for granted the, the work that they do for us and uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, Chris, just a couple of questions on a couple of areas, just uh, street and road repairs. Uh, obviously, uh, my wife and I are doing a lot more walking around town than we were before because we're not traveling too far. It appears as though, how are we doing as far as our 
five-year plan of maintaining the roads and uh, repairing them uh, as far as the level of funding that we have and keeping ahead of it or is it getting ahead of us again where the number of miles of roads that are in need of repair and replacement is expanding. I'm going to turn this over to John Clippell, the town engineer who who heads the um, the road repair. So we have uh, a current capital request for this year. Um, we're looking to, you know, stay on track of that five-year plan, but um, due to COVID last year and the, and the reduced funding, we did lose um, last year's round of, of extra streets. It's not that we didn't do anything. We, I tried to stretch the money that we had to do more crack ceiling type work, um, to really stretch out our, our roads and, and really seal those cracks before the winter came. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping to get right back on track this year. The capital request is in and um, cross my fingers that it'll get funded. And then as far as um, the cemetery's capacity, what do we have for um, projections in relation to, are we gonna need another site at some point? And when, when is that going to be? I think we're the, the current sections that we're building. I think we're a year, year and a half to to fill each section. We have two and a half uh, unfilled sections right now. The next two expansion areas that we have have already been clear cut and leveled. Uh, it's a lot more finish work um, just to get those ready. And then I know there are are further plans and and a lot more land um, at Riverside for future expansion. Um, I'm not, there's a few sections that are a little bit closer to Elm Street that I'm not sure of their total capacity, but I, it's going to be quite some time before we're, we're filling up that entire cemetery. Um, that's why I had said, you know, the small capital request right now is just to kind of finish off those next small sections, which will probably get us out another six, seven years. Okay, I just think we need to keep it on the radar screen so that if we do need uh, future expansion at other locations, we should be keeping that in mind in relation to what we have for town owned land and what we might be a suitable site. Uh, the other thing is, as far as uh, continuation of uh, allowing people to drop brush, uh, I think it's been well received throughout the community. Uh, we're going to continue uh, to allow that to happen. Is, is it the, uh, the year round people can bring the brush down? So the, the brush pile kind of runs the same, same schedule as the leaf pile. So it's April 1st to the last uh, last Sunday in November. Uh, as of right now, our plan is to continue to, to have that pile open to the public. Um, we've noticed every year as, as we continue, uh, once we have to have that pile ground down, we're, we're getting, seems better and better rates on, on the, the product. So um, right now it's not, it's working out fine. So we'll probably continue to keep doing it. I would hope so. Again, it, it's been uh, well received and got lots of comments all the time uh, on that. So other than that, uh, again, uh, for everybody's effort, GPW, it's uh, much appreciated and good presentation and I appreciate the work that you put in, uh, Chris, uh, as an interim director, you've done a terrific job. And again, uh, Mark and John and everybody else, you've done a terrific job for us. Appreciate it. Two marks. All right. Thank you, Marks, Mr. Right. We're going to go to FinCom uh, next. Mr. Bailey, have you any questions or comment? Uh, no, I don't. Great presentation. Thank you. Mr. Hegarty? Did we, we lost. <laughs> so sorry. Mr. Mills? Uh, no comments. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Mr. Kelleher? Yes, uh, Chris, I think you, you, you've been doing a great job. I think you've, you've filled in very well and uh, uh, the department uh, in presentations that I've seen from you and your, your troops have been just, just outstanding this year. And thank you for, 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 for all the work you're putting in. I do have just one question. It's a little, little bit off the, uh, the beaten path here and, and maybe something you're working on, maybe something that we've just have, you guys have discussed and have and put aside, but you mentioned the, the tipping fees are going up and we know that and they, they have been, it's a, a big uh, part of the, the, uh, the trash removal costs to the town. Some towns have gone to mandatory composting with pickup. Have we thought of that at all as a way of 
um, reducing what goes into the trash or is it, is it just another burden on, on homeowners and, and, and not a real cost saving? My understanding, I believe it was talked about uh, briefly at um, in the recycling committee at some point could probably chime in a little bit more on it, but I believe at one point it was talked about, I think the overall cost um, of adding another barrel in everybody's house and another truck that's going house to house right now is not is not that advantageous to the entire town. I, um, I believe it's pretty expensive. Um, I believe the other night we were in a meeting and Abby had said that uh, Rowley, maybe town up on the North Shore, um, had started doing that, but they were also supplemented with a, a, a grant. So um, there's obviously an added expense that if they have to supplement with a grant, I think right now it's probably not the best bet for North Reading. We had talked to JRM when we started negotiations with them of, you know, what's what's the best way for us right now to keep the cost low? And, and from talking to them and, and a couple of different other, you know, looking at different options, pretty much what North Reading is doing right now is the best way to keep the cost down. Um, so I think we'll, you know, working with the recycling committee, continue to look at different options. And uh, I think now if we, we're in the we're in the driver's seat a little bit better. I think we have been over the past couple of years where we're locked in with Covanta for a few years. We're locked in with JRM for five years. We actually have some time now to really break down different options, you know, for the next go around of contracts. Okay. All right. Just so I, I've seen it in the paper and, and towns are doing it. I know like the, the city of Gloucester is doing it and they're, it's, it's something that is, is being done more, but I just didn't, don't understand the economics of it. Um, so certainly it probably is an additional hassle to the to the homeowners of having to to separate and put out another barrel but um, I think it's worth looking at over over time and, and if you're doing that that's great thank you thank you mr. Kelleher mr. Pulver no questions thank you mr. Johnson no questions thank you mrs. Herbert yeah, um, I actually I had a question from Mark Clark, but before that, I wanted to make a comment about the um, business that we were just discussing. I went on to Black Earth or whatever the website is to see exactly what you can put in a barrel to become compost. It's amazing. Basically everything but plastics. Um, and homeowners can do it individually, etc. I mean, you can put you know, bones, pieces of meat. If you have grease, you can put it in a separate container on top of the barrel. Um, it's pretty, it's it's way more than you would ever be able to recycle with standard recycling, which is pretty much limited. So, I mean, you can even, you know, compost pizza boxes, go figure. So there are obviously a few items you can't use, but it is a very comprehensive list. So I think it's something that, we should look into not necessarily as a, uh, mandating it, but certainly look into it as a possible add-on for those that choose to go along with it uh, and not necessarily right this minute. But I did have a question from Mark Clark as well. Mark, um, with the advent, have you noticed any difference in the rate of collections of water bills uh, up or down with the advent of uh, the new water meters? You're on mute. Oh, there you go. Sorry about that. My internet tends to be a little unstable, so I didn't catch your full question. Uh, rate of collections for water bills uh, up or down with the advent of new water meters. So the, I don't believe there's been a huge shift in the rate of co collection. And if you're asking like the number of people that aren't paying their water bill that we wind up leaning, that has not significantly changed. Um, that, it tends to be historically the same people over and over from year to year that, that we wind up leaning. And the numbers on both water and trash, they go up and down a little bit year to year, but they don't change drastically. So I don't think the new meters had uh, a huge impact on that. Thank you. All set, Mrs. Herbert. Yes. I, I just you. want to follow up on that 
Oh, I think I, I just want to follow up on that composting. I know you have your hand up, Mr. Gilberto, um, because I think there, this this highlights why we need a grant writer in the town, because I think there's there may be DEP, DEP grants to, to try that out. Not that that, like Mrs. Hurlbut said, is mandated, but um, I think we, it'd be good to explore that. However, we can explore that to see what that involves. I imagine if I put a barrel of compost out here, there'd be a lot of animals going after it. So I don't really know what, what it entails, but uh oh, Mrs. Hurlbut has her hand raised. <laughs> uh, the, the, grant, um, the grant that was received was for the purchase of the composting uh, bucket. It, a good piece of it is you put it out the day that it's collected. All right. So, you know, and it has a lid on it. So if you keep it uh, uh, by your back door or wherever else, I don't think you're going to get any more animals than you do in your trash barrels. When I lived on Cold Spring Road, the squirrels actually chewed through the barrel, through the bags to get to the trash. Oh, I don't question <laughs> that for a minute. All of us have gone outside. Yeah. Of the morning and discovered that our backyard looked like something yes yeah. but it, it's it's yeah it's, it's worth looking at too. and you can work around it i mean you know you can get a metal barrel it's definitely worth worth looking into as an option depending on the cost factor and etc um and it's a good thing just in terms of being green more greener community and I also wanted to just, I don't have any questions, Mr. Deming. I just wanted to echo the comments of my, my colleagues on the board and just the tremendous job that you do, the commitment that you've made to kind of wearing both hats and stepping in. We really appreciate that. And we don't want to see you go anywhere anytime soon. So we <laughs> hope you're going to stay with us. And this team, I think we get to see them uh, like Mr. Walner explained, we get to see this team in different facets. And I'm always impressed by the presentation of this entire team of uh, department heads in terms of what they present to capital improvements for propelling us forward, just even in terms of how to manage things technologically and all of the things that your team, this whole entire team does for the town. And like Mr. O'Leary says, this, you're kind of unsung. People don't really realize how much effort all of you put in and we really appreciate it and thank you for that. Thank you. And Mr. Gilberto, I think was raising your hand as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to Ms. Hurlbut's question, I think she was inquiring of the water superintendent regarding um, capturing additional water in the meters rather than the collections. And if I misunderstood that, she can certainly correct me, but I. I think that the, the, the answer, and Mark can certainly confirm or, or not, is that you know, we, we have seen a spike in the water that we're metering being used and overall. And I think we've talked in the water hearing about how much of a difference that has made in where we could be financially with regard to the water enterprise. It really offset a significant increase in costs because we had to switch to buy water mid-year. Um, through you, Madam Chair, Mark, is there anything, do, do I have that right? Is there anything you wanna to add to that? So for what the amount we billed for this year was up phenomenal. I don't think it had anything to do necessarily with the, the meters. The meters obviously are capturing 100 percent of the water, whereas the older meters might not spend quite at 100 percent anymore. Um, again, it was a drought year, but as we've talked repeatedly, we were kind of blaming it more on COVID that there was that this much water use this year, um, which is a good thing. The new meters have been, I will, I want to say this, they've been phenomenal in terms of addressing people's questions with their water. Um, the, the, the graphical display and the ability to show people down to the hour and just where their water went. The number of complaints we get that we're able to answer with a very simple two minute phone call has uh, just been a, a real blessing to my mind. Mr. Keller, Mr. Kelleher. Yeah, just just a, a, a comment on that. When 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 we recommended the the water meters for, uh, for as a capital item several years ago, one of the selling points was that we would be able to capture more water that the to to bill it. So I think that uh, uh, if that's if that's happening, and I couldn't quite hear all of what Mark said, but 
um, that was that, that the additional water that we would be metered by putting in new meters would actually pay the debt service on the capital improvement that was uh, that was approved. So um, it, I think you said that that was happening, but I, I couldn't quite hear everything you had said, Mark. So I think I need to drill into it. Year to year, there tends to be, especially during the summer months, obviously huge shifts in water consumption. Hard to attribute that to anything other than the weather, but I think I need to go and drill probably more in the winter season and just see how much more we're billing for then as kind of a proof of, uh, of what you're talking about, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's nothing further. Mr. Gilberto, I think this, thank you to the Public Works Division. I think this concludes the budget meetings for today, right, Mr. Gilberto? Okay. I'm sure it does. All right. So we'll be uh, seeing everyone again on Monday night. Thank you. Correct. 6.40 p.m. Shall we call a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Mr. O'Leary moves to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And I think that's enough. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye now.